So I want to make a couple announcements. Um, the first one is that the ladies retreat, I don't know if there's any lodging left, but there's always enough. You can always be registered and find your own, own place to sleep. There'll be plenty of places up there. But uh, there were not many uh, rooms left, but there's plenty of registration. Uh, the other thing is that next Tuesday, my daughter is going to come. Brianna's coming to preach. Preach. She can do it if she had to. Mm -hmm. To teach about uh, teaching your raising children with spiritual warfare. So if you have young families with young children, uh, when she spoke the last time, uh, it was the largest attendance we had. So I would just encourage you to get a hold of these people and bring them and um, learn from what she has to teach them. Tonight I have uh, I have uh, three three different things that I'm going to talk about, and the last two are are very very important. The second one, the first one, is important, but not as important as the last two. So. Uh, it's important if uh, none of the things I'm talking about tonight I've ever talked about with you. And uh, I want you to ask questions. I want you to grow. I want you to mature. And uh, so that we can serve Christ. Okay. I want to begin to tell you something. We're going to have two classes in the next 12 weeks when this 12 week is over with. Um, we're going we're gonna to have two more classes. The, the, first class one, the first class of those two classes will by, be by invitation only. They will not be Zoomed. So if you're invited, you will have to come and sit in and on the classes. And uh, I have been already talking to people, and people are accepting to, to come and be a part of it. I'm not done. I'm not near done because we live so far apart, I only get a chance to talk to people now and then. The second class will be uh, going back through some of the things we went through in this class, this first class. It'll be an introductory class. And I need for you, if you want and like what you're hearing, tell people and bring them to the second class so that they can learn the spiritual principles of uh, being set free and the power and authority of Christ. So those are the things that are looking ahead of us. Does anybody have a question before I get started? Anything I've talked about that you need me to answer? I'm waiting on Nathan to come. <laughs> Present. <laughs> Let me begin with prayer. Lord, you know that that the things I'm talking about tonight are absolutely fascinating to me, but they are also, Father God, very important issues in the ministry of deliverance. So I just pray that you give me wisdom and help me to speak so that people can understand what's going on. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. But if I lay this on the computer, it won't hurt anything, will it, Dave? Okay. Question. What, what, are we, what do we have within us? We have, there's a body, a soul, and a spirit, right? Without Christ, the spirit is dead. With Christ, the spirit is alive. What's within the soul? Will and Mind, will, and emotions. Okay? So we're going to talk about the soul, but only going to talk about one part of it. Okay? You need them to scoot over? Or... Or I can see them. Can we 
right here. Mm -hmm. yeah, good. We'll just be the teacher's it. pet. <laughs> just, just move that over. So yeah. sorry, I did just start. Yeah, I need a pet. I don't have a pet. <laughs> <laughs> so first teacher in the history of the world without a pet. <laughs> So we're going to we're going to deal with the soul, but we're going to deal with the will, okay? And with the will, what relationship skill needs to be developed in your relationship with Christ in the soul when we're dealing with the will? anybody have any idea? Submission, obedience. Obedience, Mark. Where you been? But that's great. <laughs> Obedience. What class are you looking for? Is it? Hey, Greg. Hey, John knows you, so you're welcome. Come on in. So. I love it. The will. Aren't you glad I know how to spell it? It's the will. If the will is not submitted to Jesus Christ, what sin is involved? What's that? Rebellion. Write that down. Why is this important? Because if my will is not sub subjected to Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of the entire universe, then I will be tempted or prone or live in rebellion. Notice I said tempted, prone, or live in rebellion. Okay? So if you have a child, for example who is rebellious or they're prone to do their own thing, right? If you're if you're in that kind of situation, guess what? They have a problem with their will. So when I told my children and my grandchildren especially, I said, you need to understand something. You cannot do what you want to do. When someone gives you instruction, you must do what the authority says, or you will not be doing what God wants you to do. I do not say you will live in rebellion. That's for when they get a little older. You cannot do what you want to do. You must do what you're told to do. Or another thing is you tell the child, you must do what is right. Is what you want to do right? And then they'll say, oh, but I want to do that. No, that's not the question. The question is, is what you want to do right? And their answer must be, no, what I want to do is not right. If you do not begin, see, we live in a society, and if I get off on this, stop me here in a little bit. If I get off on this tangent, this rabbit hole, Get me back. In our society today, through psychology, we are raising children of rebellion because we're, we're telling parents that children must not be hindered in their development by telling them no or it's incorrect or it's wrong. Because that does not help your children, your child. It stunts their development. Children's development are stunted when there are not biblical, healthy, normal boundaries to show the child what is the difference between right and wrong. Are you with me? So draw a conclusion. So if I'm dealing with a, a child that has been raised with that psychological attitude within their family, you raise them with that. Guess what 
stronghold is going to be prevalent in that child. And it's it's everywhere. And you're saying, no, rebellion. No, it's not rebellion. Rebellion's there. The stronghold is there. But what is it? It is the sin of self-centeredness. The sin of self-centeredness. I want what I want, and I don't care how you feel about it. And you will, it will be early in adolescence, junior high, where that will be strong. If you don't stop it there, it will get stronger, and there will become another stronghold, which called, which is called entitlement. Okay. There, we have a job shortage in this world but we don't have a job shortage because we have enough people in this country, not the world, this country, we have enough people in this country to meet all the jobs that are needed. But we have, listen, listen to this. Men between the age of 20, just men, just men, men between the age of 20 and 35, take up 5% of all the welfare money that is paid to the country, uh, that are paid to people from the government. 5%. Do you understand how many billions of dollars that is? These men are not disabled in any way. They are living on their own. We're paying for their apartment or wherever they're at. They're healthy. There's not a one, not one of these men are, are unhealthy in any way. But they got on to that dole. That's an old, old term. You know what a dole is. They got on that dole somehow, and they still live there. They don't have to work, and they get paid enough money to live off of. They don't have children. These people, 5%, they don't have children. They don't have a wife. They're not divorced. We have developed a society of, of I forget the word I used now. It just went right out of my head. Entitlement. Entitlement. We are developing human beings with our philosophy of life who are being raised with strongholds arguments and pretension. Their will is not subject to God, it is subject to self. Okay? If you have a child, and when I mean child, it could be 45 on down. It's really 55 on down. Okay. From 55 on down, if you have a child that has the sin of self-centeredness in it, you need to start praying now that God will break the power of that. All right. Anybody have any idea? I'm testing you. Anybody have any idea how you can develop a healthy relationship with God in the will? Anybody? How am I, how is my will supposed to be healthy in its relationship with God? So I can develop obedience. Surrender. Surrender what? Surrender. Your will. You guys. Those are good <laughs> religious answers. <laughs> and I'm impressed that you know that, but yes, sir, but uh, well, the word says um, hide the word of God in your heart. Teach your children truth. Hide them in your heart. Okay. Deliver a passive life. You need to teach your children how to repent. What do I mean by that? You need to teach your children that independently of parenthood, they will come to you and say, Mommy or Daddy, I've lied today to get my way. You don't beat that into them. You must ask Christ to develop that characteristic within. 
So what is happening? The will of that child, which comes to you and confesses their sin to you, they will eventually transfer that submission and obedience that was to you to God. And they will have an intimate relationship with God because they find out from God what? That they can tell God where they are wrong or where they sinned, and he will still love and accept and forgive them. You, you with me? How else can you develop a submissive will in a, in a child? Well, by the way, it happens for adults that need to be, that, that have given their heart to the Lord. You know that there are people um, there are people that are led to the Lord that are 55 and older or 35, variety of adult ages, and, and they do not understand what repentance is and they don't know what it is to submit their will to God they still believe the lie that they can get what they want so what do they begin to look at God as if they do not repent of the self-centeredness Santa Claus you ever heard a name of claimant if you are name a claimant, please be mad at me. <laughs> did, you, did, you ever, did, did you ever hear of that gospel where everything is wonderful and everything is blessed and you never talk about sin? It's huge in this country. Mainline the denominations. And I'm not talking about just any... It, we do not understand what repentive lifestyle is, okay? We need to teach our children. And if you come to know the Lord late in your life, you are going to have to teach your children that. Do you know repentance is, a, is one of the ways that spiritual warfare is done? Because when I go to God and ask him to forgive me for my rebellious act, I have already begun to cut into the heart of any stronghold trying to develop itself in my life. Because he sends his grace and authority and power into the area that I've asked for forgiveness to transform me into a new being. Okay? You understand all that? If you're looking in your notebook for a teaching on obedience, I didn't write it yet. So, so it's not in there. The will. What will usurp the authority of the will? Another thing. Emotionalism. Psychology tells me that the most important thing about me is how I feel about any subject. So if I am emotionally, over emotionally sensitive, then I will not be able to take any teaching of truth from anyone because I will feel like you're offending me. In other words, you're not giving me the space to believe whatever I want to believe. And when I do that and my emotions take over me, they, they overtake me, then my will goes into neutral and lets me do whatever I want. When was the last time you ever heard a sermon preached on the will? The other day? It, it, they, they don't talk about it, do they? How does, how does a, a person's will hinder their relationship with one another and with God? When rebellion is fully activated within the will, people will say, like, uh, I really don't think I need to forgive anybody. They'll understand. 
Pride. What's that? Pride. Yes. Well, that's pride. I doesn't matter what I do. Did you know that forgiveness, why it's so important, is that it is an act of the will. Without this, guess what? Jesus died on the cross and took our sins on him as an act of his will. His father asked him to do it. The son, I said, I will go and die for this country, this one country, for mm -hmm. this world. Past, present, future, I'm going to die. For this. And then he says, forgive one another, even as I have forgiven you. Forgiveness is not an act of emotions. Have you ever prayed this, Lord God, I forgive my father-in-law in Jesus' name, even though I'm angry at him? It's an act of <laughs> it's an act of the will, isn't it? I forgive my wife in Jesus' name, but I'm still angry at her. It's an act of the will. It's an act of the will. We must have a healthy relationship with God with Jesus as the Lord of our will. It used to, I could say to people, hey, you need to submit your, your whole self to the Lord. Now I talk to them and I say, is your will, is your emotions, is your mind, are each one of them submitted to the Lord? And they do not understand what I'm saying. If your will is not controlled by God, but your emotions, then you will believe things theologically. You will believe things theologically that you feel good about, not because they're true. So you need to teach people, your children, that you must do what is right. Question. Guys are asleep already. I'm sorry. I any questions over there? Do, do you see any questions? I thought that lady was sitting there. That's just a picture. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. What would you say to someone as they're willing to confirm, verbalize that they forgive, but they're still dealing with the residual emotion of that? Because that can sometimes be sit down and say, like, you're willing to forgive, but then you're still sitting with all of that. You don't say, I hope they don't say, I'm willing to forgive. You just need to say, I forgive you, but Lord, please heal me of all the pain that happened in this event. So, so forgiveness happens even though all the pain is not healed. If they, if they don't forgive and they have pain, then God cannot touch that pain. Do you, do you understand what I mean? So if you forgive in Jesus' name, then God is then free because you've released them of your judgment to come and begin to heal you in your pain. Forgiveness is essential for the healing of pain in our life. It's essential. It sounds like a nice thing to write down. Though. It's essential. But if you if your will is not under submission of Christ, forgiveness is very hard. Very, very hard. Remember, don't 
don't miss what I said about, about if your emotions are not submitted to Christ, your will becomes neutral. It doesn't function. And you will believe about God the things that make you feel good and not truth. The will must be willing to always do what God says is due in a situ in any situation. Let's look at, let's look at a complex issue. Let's say that that your your spouse is in a set of circumstances and they experience a great deal of pain. Okay, your spouse is hurt. All right. And they, they are unwilling because of the magnitude nature of the event that occurred to create that pain or the wound within them that they just don't want to ask for, to forgive us. I forgive those people in Jesus' name. You can, by an act of your will in the authority of Jesus' name, create an atmosphere of healing in that person or that child, so that they can begin to heal to the point where they will then be willing, willing to forgive in Jesus' name. You've got to do, you've got to be able to do that. You understand? That makes sense. Any question? Oh, she <laughs> Anybody, do you write it down, Victoria? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm working on it. She's trying to create an atmosphere. If, you're, if your spouse or child is in, in a situation where there was an event where they were wounded severely, okay, and they are not able within themselves to forgive so that further healing can happen in them, you as an act of your will, because you have a spiritual authority in your relationship over them, you can create an atmosphere over that, that spouse or that child that will begin to facilitate a healing until they are strong enough to forgive in Jesus' name and continue and further the healing. Did you get that that time? How do you create that atmosphere? What age are you talking about? Yes, what age are you talking about? Well, let me answer her. Okay. What was it you said? <laughs> How do you create that atmosphere? You must be willing to... I'll tell you what I do. I lay my hands on my wife, or my wife will lay her hand on me, and, and they will pray that God will heal the events that went on in our lives. We pray this for our children. We even have done this for our grandchildren so that, so that God will come to them and he, they will be, he will be forgiven. He will begin to create an atmosphere of healing so that, so that those, those people, those children, adults, whoever it is, can begin to heal. So number one is you, you pray for the number of, that's, that's, that's what you have to do. It's prayer. That's why prayer is a tool in spiritual warfare. You're doing spiritual warfare against the enemy that wants to hurt your family through an event so that they can come to the point where they can forgive. And how old? Somebody, got, somebody answered that question. How old can you be to have spiritual authority over your children? How old? Till you die. So it doesn't matter how. If you're 95, you're 95 and your children are in their 70s, you can pray that for your children. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so obviously you're going to create a different atmosphere for an elementary age kid as opposed to a 28, 29 year old, 30, whatever. No, same same atmosphere. What can you, can you give me an example of the difference of like the atmosphere? There, there is no difference. Are this you, is an atmosphere. Are you talking about prayer or are you talking about like creating a... I'm talking about atmosphere. You ask about atmosphere. Okay, so what 
Are you talking about just prayer or are you talking about? If you had a five year old that was sick and it needed to be in the hospital, you would take it to the hospital. If you had a 35 year old that was sick and needed to be in the hospital, you'd take it to the hospital. This atmosphere is an atmosphere created by Christ. And he knows exactly what that atmosphere looks like, depending on the event that that person was in that caused the damage. Mm -hmm. So that's up to him. I cannot be in control of that. Mm -hmm. But I can ask God to create that atmosphere. So you're basically talking about prayer. You're not talking about like creating a physical atmosphere. Thank you. No, I'm not. Okay. What? You said you were next. It's okay. I just was thinking that we, with another person, our wife or our husband or whatever, if you, whoever, like we can be the proxy for the person. We're the proxy for the person in, in essence, right? So, well, I don't. Can I be ordinary? No, I, I can't be a pro. That. I don't go. I don't go before the Lord. For that person in that pain, what I do is ask God to come down and create an atmosphere. I'm taking the authority God has given me to say, go to my five-year-old. I mean, there's terrible things that happen to five-year-olds today. And, and create an atmosphere so that this child will be able to eventually forgive and go on and heal. So really, it is. it kind of is because the child doesn't have that. Uh, capability to do that for themselves at four or five years old. Nor a 29 year old. Well, sometimes not. But so I think that I, I'm just thinking that that's right. Like, if you want to call it okay. proxy, I agree with you. Well, or advocate. advocate or, yeah. A what? We're praying for proxy. Standing for standing. We're standing in for someone, right? But you're not doing that. You're praying over someone. I don't look at it that way. Okay. But it doesn't mean you're wrong. It doesn't mean I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, what, did, what did they say? You're from West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> what you told you? Who told you that? Oh. I think you have to be careful because with that kind of thinking, because it would seem... You mean my thinking or proxy? A proxy because... And I would be afraid that I would be making myself the Messiah instead of praying that God will heal the events you're not stepping in the, the child has to forgive you're praying that God will make the atmosphere for the child to be ready to forgive or have the ability to forgive okay yeah you, yeah, Mark, you I like your, well, I like your term atmosphere. And what that makes me think of is, you know, there have been times when people have hurt my wife very badly. And I have some, I have probably more experience creating a bad atmosphere than a good atmosphere <laughs> in <laughs> assisting her in dealing with that pain. Um, <laughs> but there, I've learned over the years, there are definitely things that I can say and do that will make it worse for her and make it more difficult for her to forgive and to heal. And there are other things I can do and say and pray that will make it easier for her to forgive and to heal. Yeah. And so I think my role in that situation is not to forgive anyone on her behalf. And it's not to tell her if she needs to forgive someone. It's to come alongside her and like I say, I like the word atmosphere, create an atmosphere where she feels safe to express emotions and heal to the point where she can take the step that God's calling her to take. Oh, well, he didn't applaud. <laughs> Bo, did you applaud? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Bo. All I just want to say was like the word atmosphere, uh, there's some words that come to mind as they even if you're more speaking, like you know, an atmosphere of peace, an atmosphere of stability, an atmosphere of, of, of love and calm, and angels too. In the atmosphere, when you pray, you ask God's ministry and angels to come and fill the atmosphere. 
It's kind of a spiritual deal. It's not. It's real spiritual. It's a total spiritual deal. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it's like totally. Yeah. So the atmosphere, if we have atmosphere in, uh, in, in, in the earth, you know. Yes, we do. Like, you know, when the atmosphere is cloudy and you can't see very good, it's, you know, but you're, you're creating, you know, you're asking God to make clarity and, and open sky, open heaven. Good. I'm glad you guys saw it. Yeah, I didn't think that through. I just thought that that would if the word made sense to me. Thank you. Anybody have anything to say? A lady still stand there. Me and me stand. God bless you. Yeah, John. Zoom question. Zoom. What if they're in a different state so you can't lay hands on them? Don't worry about it. Just pray for them. The hand, the, the laying on of hands is not an ingredient for uh, holiness to happen. Just pray for it. That, that's great. Yeah. My, my father was in the hospital with COVID and he died there and we couldn't see him. We, we couldn't get to him to touch him. We, we would have laid hands on him. So what did we do? We asked God to comfort him. So we created an atmosphere that way. So good. You guys are good. Jeff, give them up. You, you <laughs> applauded. You applauded for Mark. Yeah. Anyone else? We're doing okay. Mm -hmm. Was there another question that I missed? I think one of the things that I've been doing is I've just been praying for, for kids and stuff uh, to, to soften their hearts and open their eyes with, with his light. And uh, it's just a beautiful thing to see just people, you know, walk by you and stuff with tears in their eyes. Yeah, that's intercessory prayer. Intercessory. Yeah, because they're not your family. Right. They're, they're people you care about and love. Don't get me wrong. And what you're doing is exactly correct. But that's a little different. That's, that's, different. A, that's an intercessory prayer on behalf of somebody that needs to be touched by God. We're, I'm talking specifically about a family. Okay? Nothing wrong with what you're doing. Keep it up. Someone else? Another question? Hey, we were talking about creating an atmosphere. Where was my mind at? I don't know where it was at. Yeah. So we, we must remember that if the will is not under the Lord's eye, oh, where I was going. If the will is not under the authority of Jesus Christ, then we will live in a state of rebellion. Okay. Another reason to create an atmosphere for somebody that's hurt, that you can keep that rebellion. If they are living in continual long-term rebellion, it's as unto witchcraft. What is witchcraft? Control, manipulation. That all? Serving the devil. What's that? Serving the devil. Curses. Curses. Being influenced by Satan for his perfect, in his mind, in his mind, his perfect will to be done in your life in anybody else's life. Control, manipulation, anger, unforgiveness, bitterness. And when it is taken to it, by the way, every person that I minister to that are that is not just messing with the occult, but people who are in witchcraft, which is different than just messing with the, the occult. For example, Harry Potter books are messing with the occult, and it can lead to witchcraft, but it's there's a difference between that, okay? And I suspect in the next five to 10 years, there are going to be more and more people seek out help who were children of Christians who were involved with Harry Potter and they were involved in witchcraft and they didn't even know it. Okay. But witchcraft, anger, bitterness, and hatred is so strong 
that that anger and bitterness drives that person that anger and resentment towards God to go and worship Satan. And that's what witchcraft is. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? I had a, a, a girl came to see me. She was a woman. She had two children. Husband died in Vietnam because of Agent Orange. And uh, she told me she was a witch. And I've told you part of this story. But she told me that uh, she was 12 years old and she got baptized. She gave her heart to the Lord. She told me the testimony, how Christ came and lived in her heart and the changes that were happened. And she, she got baptized that day. Her grandfather began to sexually molest her. And it made her so angry and afraid and so much pain in her life that she began to pursue Satan to kill her grandfather. And he died. And so she became a full um, witch. There was a lady that used to have predictions every January. Dixon was her name. Yeah. She's a witch. She was a full, she was a nationally known witch. And she studied under her. And in order for her to be certified as a witch in the spiritual world, she had to stick her hand through fire and touch Satan. And she did. Never was burned. Okay. Okay. That's the anger. Remember, started with anger, rebellion, and pain through. And she went clear towards witchcraft. That's why it said that. Rebellion as un, is as unto to witchcraft. Her will was not under the control of Jesus Christ. It was under control of herself to begin with. And then Satan. There were certain demons aside to her that she could tell to do things. It was interesting. I hate the devil. I want you all to know that. I hate him. Because of what he does. And in order to go, let me tell you the extent of this. In order for him to bless her, she had to promise him her two boys, when they turned to be age 21, they were going to be killed. And the reason she came to me, hey, that's evil, sister, that's just evil. And so the reason she came to me was she had known Christ when she was 12, and she saw herself saved, and she came to me because... She wanted her children to be saved from that, that contract, that covenant that was made. We, when, you're in, when you're with this kind of ministry, you witness some awesome, awesome things that are just absolutely phenomenal. So, how are we doing? Do we got 10 minutes? Anybody got, else got a question? Yes. Are you saying that the lady made a covenant with Satan? Like, are you not aware that human beings do that? Yeah, I know, I do. But is that what happened with that lady who said she made a covenant with Satan? She was kids? one of the high. She was right? one of the high witches of the United States of America. They gave her kids away. She made a covenant for like the kids to be taken at twenty-one and to be killed. And in exchange for what? For all the powers she got oh. from Satan. I forgive her. And didn't she come to you like when she when her kids were nineteen or something, or they were getting old? No, they were they were about sixteen. Oh, okay. Sixteen, seventeen, somewhere. I I don't remember Victoria. I'm, I'm sixty seven, and as they said that last meeting, I'm an old man. I don't remember all this, so, but it's somewhere in that area. Did she completely come out of witchcraft? Who her? But, but, yeah, the one. The about, she she brought me her jewelry that she wore to do incantations and spells as a denouncement of her relationship with Satan. And she recommitted her life to Jesus Christ and was born again. Mm -hmm. And I took the stuff and threw it away. Mm -hmm. Dealt with a, a witch here a few years ago that uh, she had boxes of that stuff and they burn them 
Yeah. I wasn't there when they burned, but they burned, they were burned. And there's a possibility that lady may give a short testimony at the women's retreat. I'm not sure about that yet, but she's someone else.